Now we're going to be talking about epispadius and hypospadius. And <clears throat> hypospadius is a congenital anomaly in which the actual opening of the urethral meatus is below the normal placement on the glands of the penis. And the degree of the misplacement uh, of the urethral opening can vary. It can be, um, may, may only be slightly ventral to the glands or as far back as the penis and the scrotal junction. Cordi or cordy or uh, that downward curvature of the penal shaft is usually seen in more um, severe cases of hypospadias. And there's some associated anomalies, which include undescended testes and inguinal hernias that can also be uh, present. That dorsal placement of the urethra opening, or epispadius, can also occur, but it is very uncommon. Hypospadias is one of the most common congenital anomalies, um, occurring about one in every of uh, every. 250 male children. The risk is e increased if either the father or a sibling has the anomaly. Some other contributing factors include maternal age, over 35 years of age, intrauterine exposure to environmental chemicals, and possible genetic mutation. Um, testes are undescended in about 10% of the affected children, and the risk for inguinal hernia is increased. Epispadius is extremely rare and is often associated with uh, bladder extrophy. So <clears throat> in our clinical manifestations, uh, we'll have ventral placement of the urethra opening, altered urinary stream, and cordy are physical manifestations of hypospadias. A defect on the top side of the penis is indicate, indicate, indicative I'm sorry, of epispadias and the appearance of lower uh, urinary tract structures outside the abdominal wall is seen with that bladder extrophy. Uh, diagnosis is usually based on physical exam. Therapeutic management is surgical intervention. It's usually done in one stage. They have the release of the cordy and the lengthening of the urethra. Uh, repositioning of the meatus at the penile tip, reconstruction of the penis, and it's usually done between 6 and 12 months of age. It's important that you remember that no um, circumcision of the infant should happen with um, hypospadias because what's going to happen is uh, the surgeon will use part of the skin um, when he does the circumcision for the hypospadias repair. <clears throat> um, the therapeutic management, as I said before, is surgical intervention done in one stage. Usually they'll have a stent or a catheter in place after surgery. And, and keep in mind that they'll have the goal of surgery is to make urinary and sexual function as normal as possible and to improve the cosmetic appearance of the penis. This is just a little discussion question. If the nurse is teaching parents of a neonate who has um, a child born with hypospadias and the parents ask you how come their boy uh, cannot have a circumcision, how should the nurse respond? And basically it's the foreskin will be used during that reconstruction of the penis. So that will definitely relieve those parents' minds, especially if they want their child to have a circumcision. So. Anytime uh, our children are undergoing surgery, we, we would like to provide a surgical tour, especially in the wake-up room, determine the child's words, words for penis, urination, etc., encourage the parent to remain with the child as appropriate, provide, provide that uh, support and reassurance, assist the child to cough, deep breathe, um, frequently reposition infants, perform frequent vital signs, and teach splinting of, um, of the incision and incentive spirometer uh, preoperatively. Assess and monitor for any bladder spasms and an incisional pain, provide analgesics as ordered, uh, regulate IV fluids, keep strict INO, um, so measure daily weights, 
teach um, the need to keep the skin dry and odor free and provide any written instructions to parents and, and also to provide any kind of contact um, number if problems occur. We're always looking um, to make sure that we, have, we provide a high fluid intake to main hydration and a flow of urine and we need to teach the parents to monitor the child's temperature and, as, and observe that urine for any cloudiness or any foul smell. Um, any signs of UTI, UTI should be reported immediately and sometimes they will order uh, prophylactic antibiotics um, for the um, child or the infant. Um, Okay, I think that's it. And then we'll go on to our um, glomerular nephritis and nephrotic syndrome in children. Cryptorchidism is undescended or hidden testes, which can occur um, one or both testes that fail to descend through that inguinal, inguinal canal into the scrotal sac. Um, congenital cryptorchidism is a common neurological problem with approximately 4.5% of normal healthy boys having at least one undescended testy discovered at birth. Premature infants have a significantly higher incidence and that's about 30%. Um, it's usually seen more frequently in low birth weight or smaller than average length newborns. Um, most newborns um, have spontaneous descent of their testes during the first six months of life. And make sure that you um, make sure that you know that children with undescended testes are at increased risk for testicular malignancy and infertility. And that exposure to the testes to the heat of the body leads to low sperm counts you know, at sexual maturity. So it's a good history um, taking if, especially if a young man comes in and they haven't been able to have children. So that would be one question that you would ask. Remember, they also are at greater risk for torsion and trauma, um, frequently associated with an inguinal hernia. And the clinical manifestations, um, the testes are not palpable, nor they easily guided into the scrotum. Um, and we can, um, when we d look at our diagnostic evaluation, we look at whether one or both of the testes have, um, un have been undescended. If the test is not palpable, in some instances, we'll go ahead and do an ultrasound, uh, CT scan, MRI to determine the location. And it's interesting because um, it, the missing testes can be found at any point along the process vaginalis, um, which may be located in the abdomen or it may follow an ap apparent course and come to lie in the inguinal, inguinal area, maybe the base of the penis or the perineum. Um, it can also be in the intra-abdominal. Um, we may find um, testes which may require um, exploratory surgery by lap or an orchiopexy may be performed. When neither testes can be palpated, the child may, may be evaluated for, presence, um, for their presence by hormonal stimulation and the measurement of testosterone response. If they have an elevated FSH and LH levels accompanied by absent testosterone, that could indicate testicular absence and a true absence of both um, of the testes is very, very rare. Uh, initially, the infant with undescended testicles is managed by observation because usually there's that spontaneous descent during the first six months of life, and that's very common. If the condition persists, they can do an orchipexy 
is performed to bring the testes down into the scrotal sac and suture it in place. Um, that's usually done by lap approach. And the most common complications to that surgery is bleeding and infection. The optimal time for surgery is, is usually is, you know, up to the physician. Um, they usually say that um, increased frequency at six months, of, six months of age is common, but no later than ages nine to 15 months of age. And the purpose of that is, of course, to re re uh, reduce the risk of infertility and malignancy. And it's always important to teach the male um, adolescent to perform testicular self-exams throughout life um, to screen for any kind of malignancy. So our nursing care of the child, of this child, um, will, uh, under our nursing diagnosis, is deficient um, knowledge, especially parenteral, related to the cause and the management of undescended testicles and the risk for ineffective health maintenance related to possible decreased fertility and increased risk of testicular cancer or malignancy. So under our nursing care, uh, it should be directed at educating parents and providing them with information and resources. And if the child has a bilateral undistended testes or absence of testes, make sure we refer to a counselor, psychologist, or a specialist may be uh, appropriate. It's important um, to monitor after an orchipexy the patient's voiding patterns, and the pain level of the child or the infant, and swelling or any um, signs or symptoms of bleeding or infection. Now we're going to be talking about vesico-ureteral reflux, and just remember um, of the anatomy that there's a wave-like mechanism at the junction of the ureter and the bladder, which prevents urine reflux into the ureters. So as urine fills the bladder or as the bladder contracts, during voiding, pressure in the bladder occludes the opening to the ureter, so we don't have reflux. But when a defect occurs at the vesico ureteral junction, then we'll have what they call VUR, which is vesico-ureteral reflux. And that results from that, that's that primary reflux, usually uh, from a congenital anomaly um, that affects that junction. Secondary reflux um, can be um, associated with a lower UTI is also possible, and that's just transitory VUR. Reflux with infection is the most common cause of pyelonephritis in children, and it's the same type of signs and symptoms that we see in UTI. And you may see those clinical manifestations of pyelonephritis, which is more of a systemic um, infection than um, a UTI in the bladder. On page 461, it gives, there's an international classification of reflux. Um, and it's graded. Uh, it shows you the normal on the very far left top, um, and it shows you the mouth. There is a there is a um, valve from the ureter into the bladder, and then grade one, you'll see there's reflux up into the ureter only, and there's no dilation. Grade two, we see reflux into the ureter, the pelvis, the cal the calces with no dilation and normal um, calceal uh, fornices. Grade three, we have mild dilation of the ureter and mild dilation of the renal pelvis. And then grade four and grade five are worse, worsening um, reflexes into, those, um, into, the, into the kidney. You don't have to know the international classification of reflux, but you, you can appreciate, I think, from, from this picture of the severity if untreated and um, which would lead to kidney failure. So it's divided and this slide just goes over the d division of the different um, grades of um, vesico 
ureteral reflex and there's grade 3, 4, and 5 as mentioned before and you can see on page 461. Here's some diagnostic tests that they'll do. They'll do a urinalysis and a urine culture, do electrolytes, BUN, uh, creatinine, uh, imaging studies, usually plan about three to six weeks after the infection to allow for any infectious inflammation to subside. Then they'll do an ultrasound avoiding cystourethrogram. So this, this slide kind of gives you some ideas of what they do with the different grades. Uh, grades 1 and 2, they conti do continuous low-dose antibacterial uh, therapy with frequent urine cultures. Grade 3 is managed with antibiotics unless complications are present. And then grade 4 and 5, <laughs> excuse me, oh. uh, grade 4 and 5 may require surgical intervention. So nursing considerations, explain the treatment plan, uh, you know, help the patients, patient and family um, with that treatment plan, um, explain that medical management may last for years, adherence to antibiotics is very, very important, and if surgical in intervention is necessary, educate, you know, pre-op and post-op repair, and that will come from your physician orders. Okay, we're going to stop at this one. I um, just wanted to refer you to page 463. It's the patient-centered patient teaching and how to manage and prevent urinary tract infections. Um, and this is great teaching for our, for our parents um, and, and making sure that they do prevent urinary tract infections and how important it is to follow up, make sure the antibiotics are given for the full number of days that's been ordered. Um, usually they have to ha have a follow-up urine culture to the lab, if, especially if the physician or nurse practitioner has requested one. Keep the follow-up appointments um, and make sure that you call uh, the nurse practitioner or physician, the health care provider, if the child has a fever or any symptoms that may make you think that the infection has returned. Uh, preventing UTIs from recurring is important because repeated infections, as you know, can cause kidney damage. And here is the suggestions are bulleted um, in the box under patient-centered teaching, but, wipe, but, but make sure you teach parents to wipe babies and teach young girls to wipe from front to back after going to the bathroom. Be sh make sure to keep the foreskin on uncircumcised baby boys as clean as possible. Um, encourage your toilet trained child to avoid ho holding urine and to urinate at least four times a day and completely emptying, empty, emptying the bladder. Um, parents are told to give their child lots of fluids throughout the day to help flush out the bladder. Um, avoid dressing the child in tight clothing or diapers. Use cotton underwear rather than synthetic, synthetic fabrics. Avoiding uh, bubble baths, which can irritate the urinary system, and emphasize proper hygiene, um, especially if they have a daughter who's sexually active and encourage her to urinate immediately after sexual intercourse. And then we'll go on in our next web link on to some more congenital abnormalities. Now we're going to be talking about the pediatric um, disorders with a genitourinary alteration. This is the anatomy of the genitourinary system in a little girl, and she looks about age four to seven, maybe years of age. So you can it tells you a little bit about the placement of the kidneys and the ureter and the bladder. There are some differences in the genitourinary system. Complete maturation of the kidney occurs usually between 6 and 12 months of age. And before this time, the filtration capacity of the glomeruli is reduced. So urine is voided frequently and has a very, very low specific gravity because of that glomerulus um, filtration rate being reduced. So it's like they can't concentrate urine. Fluid uh, cons 
constitutes a larger fraction of an infant's and small child's total body weight. The kidneys are less efficient at um, regulating electrolyte and acid-base balance and eliminating some drugs from the body. The maturity of those renal structures predisposes the infant to dehydration and, of course, fluid volume excess. Bladder capacity increases usually from about 20 to 50 mLs at birth to about 700 in an adult. The intervention, the innervation of the stretch receptors in the bladder wall does not occur before the age of two. Um, so the, that kind of gives you an idea that when, um, when that at least um, has been matured, you're going to have that child feel that sense of fullness, so, and before that they won't. The urethra is shorter in children than in adults and may contribute to the frequency of UTIs that you especially see in children. Kidneys are, are more susceptible to trauma in children because they do not have as much padding as you and I do, as we all know. Well, especially me. I don't know about you, but especially me. So some of the diagnostic tests and assessments of the renal system that you'll see, uh, of course, is the urine specimen for analysis. It can be a clean catch or it can be a sterile. IVP, radiographs of the kidneys, ureters, and bladder, renal bladder, ultrasound, cystograms, CTs, voiding, cystourethrograms, and MRIs. On page, this is, this is chapter 20 in your PEDS book, The Child with a Genital Urinary Problem. And um, in, on page, let me just refer you to it real quick, um, is the common labs and diagnostic tests are on page 456 if you wanted to follow along. But I think it's important that you have a basic understanding of what's normal for specific gravity. Um, and if it's high, what does it mean? And if it's lower, what does it mean? Uh, the pH sometimes is altered by diet. Um, usually it's 4.5 to 8. Glucose, uh, detection of glucose in the urine. We should not detect glucose in the urine. And we really want to make sure that we, we do um, a, just a simple urine dipstick, especially if the child has been having um, problems with the enuresis. Uh, nocturia at night, make sure they're, they're not a diabetic. We want to check for ketones, um, and children are more prone to development of, of ketouria, so we want to make sure that that's negative. Leukocyte esterase, that's just the enzyme that re is released during the white blood cell breakdown, and that should be negative. If it's positive, it may indicate that there's a possible UTI. Our nitrates uh, produced by selective select bacteria that should be negative, and when it's positive, it usually means that there's some some um, bacteria in the in the urine. White blood cells usually seen with infection. Urine um, culture is usually indicated for that. Red blood cells. It's very normal in menstruating females, but it could mean that there's um, mean that there's trauma, stones, infection, or, or glomerulonephritis. Bacteria, there should be none in the urine, and if, if there is, um, it's indicative of a UTI, and a culture should be done to see what, what kind of um, organism and what sensitivity there is for um, which antibiotic. CAS um, are just WBC CAS and red blood cell CAS that are originate in the kidney tubules. Um, usually indicate if they're, if they're present, pyelonephritis, glomerulonephritis, some kind of renal infarct, collagen disease, interstitial inflammation of the kidney, um, and urine, of course, urine culture and sensitivity, presence of bacteria. Um, it should be negative or less than 100,000 colonies per ml of urine from the clean catch or a sterile specimen. Usually, if, if it's indicated there's isolation and identification of pathogens in that urinary tract, and then there's identification, of course, of antibiotic sensitivity. Um, serum studies, of course, will be when um, that's the end product of 
protein metabolism, blood, urea, and nitrogen. Nitrogen is that end product um, and usually increases in renal insufficiency. Your serum creatinine is a byproduct of muscle metabolism uh, production and it's usually constant as long as the muscle mass remains constant. And it should be assessed before um, giving any kind of nephrotoxic type agents. And of course, as you know, it increases in renal uh, insufficiency. Um, it goes into the different radiographs, your um, kidney, ure ureter, and bladder, um, cystoscopy, and they go up and they examine the bladder and the lower tract to see if there's any tumor or stones. Of course, CT of the scan, um, CT scan, sorry, CT scan. Um, to check for any renal tumors, voiding cystogram, voiding cystourethrogram, um, it detects uh, reflux of urine into the ureters and its severity, so that at that VE junction we talked about the other day. Uh, renal ultrasound assesses the position, the size, the contour of the kidneys and the ureters, and um, any kind of urodynamic studies can be done voiding dis for any voiding dysfunction and any abnormal urinary tract um, problems. And that's on, as I said before, it's on page 456. It starts there. These are the serum blood tests that may be done. We've already talked about BUN and creatinine. Um, and we haven't talked too much about serum electrolytes, but as you remember, the functions of the kidney is the production of um, renin, which helps with the regulation of blood pressure. And release of renin is uh, stimulated primarily by the decreased pressure in the afferent arterioles of the glomerulus. Remember also that the kidney um, functions to produce erythropoietin, which stimulates red blood cell production by the bone marrow. And it also um, metabolizes vitamin D in its active form, which is important, um, especially with calcium. So those may be some red flags for us as we look at our serum blood tests, but know that they, there are other, a lot of other differentials that you have to think about as well. Okay, these, we're gonna start talking a little bit about urinary tract infection and veso, and ves, vesicoureteral reflux. It's that, that word I can't hardly say. Anyway, um, UTIs. UTIs, as you know, we've talked, um, hopefully you've listened to the lecture on um, Chapter 69 in um, Iggy, but it's caused by bacteria that ascends from the outside, the urethra, into the bladder. And from the bladder, bacteria may continue to ascend into the upper urinary tract. Uh, usually fecal bacteria uh, is most common cause of UTIs, and that's probably uh, approximately 80%. So here are some of the, this slide goes over some of the anatomical and physical factors that predispose to urinary tract infections, and they include females because of the short urethra, which provides a real ready access for invasions of, of different types of organisms. The males, there's increased incidence in uncircumcised in infants, especially younger than one year of age. There also could be, um, the, the child could be predisposed because of urinary stasis or the ves vesico-ureteral uh, reflux, sexual activity in adolescent girls, any kind of urinary tract obstruction, um, and constipation in the child can also cause a UTI. There, this slide just goes over the different signs and symptoms in the infant versus the child. In the, so we'll first start with the infant. Uh, fever, they may have, hypo, may have hypothermia in the neonate. Um, irritability, uh, difficulty urinating, change in urine odor or color, poor weight gain, feeding difficulties. In our child, um, the clinical manifestations may be abdominal or suprapubic pain, voiding frequency, voiding urgency, difficulty urinating, new or increased incidence of enuresis, um, that nighttime bedwetting, and um, the, 
the child may or may not have a fever. Under our diagnostic evaluation, we're going to get the history from the parent. Uh, we'll do our physical exam, do a urinalysis, and do a urine culture and sensitivity. Um, under therapeutic management, we'll eliminate that current um, infection, identify any contributing factors, especially if the child maybe has constipation, predisposes him or her to UTIs. Uh, we want to prevent urosepsis and we want to preserve that renal function. Very, very important. So our nursing considerations, we want to monitor INO, we want to observe for signs of dehydration in the infant and the child, um, administer antibiotics as ordered, um, obtain daily weights, uh, encourage frequent voiding, especially in the toilet trained child, because um, you know as children, you know, they want, they'd rather play than, than pee. Um, or poop, so you know, want to make sure that we remind them. You know, especially, you know, I, I love how kids always, you know, kind of, kind of dance around, and you can always tell the hand goes right down to the genital area, and you know that they have to go potty, but they just don't want to take the time to do it. So it's really cute. Anyway, we also want to encourage increased fluid intake. Very important, and it's important to educate um, the child and family as well. We're going to take a break right here and we'll continue on another on another web link for the vesico vesico ureteral reflux. Okay, talk to you in a minute.